Hello and welcome to Enterprise Architecture Planning. We are delighted to have you here today. My name is Sonika and I am your host. Your presenter is Saurabh Hajela, founder and, C and executive editor of CIO Index. Good morning, Saurabh. Good morning, Sonika. Good morning, everybody else. Delighted to be with you guys. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, before we start, I just want to take a moment to address some housekeeping issues. Uh, this webinar will last for about an hour. Saurabh will present for about 45 to 50 minutes. The last 10 to 15 minutes will be spent answering any questions that are presented by you, the audience. Please note that the control panel is on the right side of your screen, which comprises of three panes and a grab tab. The first pane gives you your details. The second pane is a quick reference guide about this webinar. The third pane allows you to submit any questions to me, your host. Questions are answered in the order received. If there is a need for a broadcast message during this webinar, you will also be able to view it here. The grab tab allows you to minimize the control panel to the side of your laptop. You can also download an attendee quick reference guide from our events page on CIOindex.com. In the event that you drop your connection, please dial back in. In the unlikely event that our connection is dropped, please wait five minutes and then dial back in. Make sure your microphone is on mute at all times. That's it for me now. Over to you, Saurabh. Thank you so much, Sonika. And uh, again, uh, Welcome, everybody, to this very exciting topic. I am delighted to be leading this uh, discussion on enterprise architecture planning. Before we begin, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I am the founder and executive editor of CIO Index, and I've got about 25 years plus of experience moving through IT ranks. I started my career as a consultant to IBM's Glendale Labs, so I saw hardcore operating system level programming uh, and then moved all the way through systems development, client server, systems architecture, enterprise architecture, IT strategy, and for the last 12-14 uh, years I've been focused mostly on the business value side of IT. I was also the head of e-business for ING, uh, and that is the $26 billion B2B business side. And then I was also the head of e-business for Prudential. I led the team that developed the uh, entire intellectual capital for AT Kearney. We won an award for it. And I also led the team that uh, did IT strategy. I was a member of that team, actually, for Booz Allen. So I've got, I've got a, a varied perspective of having seen this issue from different angles. For enterprise architecture planning, I've done multiple projects, uh, two of them are worth highlighting. One was a $16 billion organization which was going through an outsourcing exercise, so we were doing enterprise architecture planning for that. So I led that team. And the other one was where we implemented an object-oriented enterprise architecture framework uh, for a $12 billion organization. Before we begin, I wanted to get a little bit of perspective from you. So uh, we're going to push a poll. Please take a minute to read the poll and respond to it. The more uh, you 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 know participate the better this webinar gets for all concerned. So Sonika, if you don't mind, would you please push the first poll? Okay, we can close the poll now. Now, in this webinar, we are going to continue the journey that we started 
about four webinars ago. And the journey has been trying to understand how IT creates value. And we started by looking at business capability. We started actually by looking at business model, business capability, IT capability, the connection between the two, and how processes define and drive effectiveness and efficiency of IT capability. Now we've, we've gone from understanding the big picture, starting with the business model. In this webinar, we're going to be talking about enterprise architecture planning because this is the inflection point where we're going to take the journey from conceptual to physical. And enterprise architecture planning is that link that connects your overall IT strategy, for the lack of a better word, but it's actually a connection of your conceptual IT capability with your physical IT capability. IT strategy is creating effectiveness by aligning IT capability with business requirements. We saw that in the first and second webinars. IT strategy is also translating business requirements into IT solutions. That's what we are about to see, how that transition, how that journey happens. Enterprise architecture planning is that link that does the transformation. It takes the logical, it maps it to the physical. The logical, like we describe, are all the business drivers, all of the various things that describe and define IT capability. Unfortunately, I can't go through that uh, in this webinar. And then I'm, I'm going to touch upon that in, in a couple of slides, but I can't go through the entire thing, obviously. And then we will see how the enterprise architecture paints a picture that makes this connection and how we can make that, that painting much easier to understand by using objects that appear in natural environment versus using constructs such as applications uh, and, and infrastructure and the way enterprise architecture planning is being done today. IT organizations, IT organizations are also a critical component of IT capability, you may recall. So the design and structure and skills of the organization are absolutely critical to creating an efficient and effective organization, IT capability, and IT strategy. We're also going to touch upon, you know, I wanted to give you a high-level view to enterprise architecture. Usually we, we, we see these things in silos. We look at IT strategy in a silo, we look at enterprise architecture planning in a silo, Sourcing is, is its own silo, governance is its own silo, but they're all connected. And, and as much as I'm, I'm you know, emphasizing the journey from business model to business capability, strategy, IT strategy, IT capability, this is not a sequential journey. This is not only a top-down journey because all of us understand that and should understand at this point that the journey can go the other way. I mean, the internet proved that the journey went from technology changing business models were, you know, versus just the business model demanding a certain enabling capability. And that is why all of the discussion that is happening these days about CIOs and the changing role of CIOs and the, and the whole need to become business leaders, one has to understand that the realm has changed now. The realm used to be, the whole paradigm was, you know, first give me some IT capability, give me applications, give me infrastructure. Then they said, well, you know, I need some enabling things. So where you align business with IT. So now all of a sudden, you're in the game of business value. And now what has happened is that they're saying, hey, you know, it's all very fine and interesting for you. Give me stuff that I, I'm asking for, but I don't want the CIO to be an order taker. I want the CIO now to be a driver of business value. So why don't you tell me how I can create business value, how, how can I create shareholder value? So this driver of business value is where people you know, tend to not understand what is being asked of CIOs is to now become CEOs of their own IT organizations where they create products and services which are of value to their market, which in turn uses those products and services to create value. I mean, this is something we saw in a previous webinar where we were uh, discussing creating a business within a business. Uh, type of an IT organization. Again, we can't go through the entire thing. Now, the three components that I've chosen to illustrate the connection, one is IT strategy and enterprise architecture connection. The second is a system strategy. What exactly is system strategy? How is it different from IT strategy? I've read a lot of these articles where people tend to use the word strategy and then plaster it with anything and everything without understanding what it really means when, it, when we say IT strategy 
what it means when we say system strategy. I'm going to touch upon system implementation because I want to, I want to complete this journey and then systems architecture and then connect all of these things using IT capability which is what we have been after from the point we understood there's something called an IT capability which parallels business capability. You may recall that we spoke about business drivers. Um, our journey to enterprise architecture starting with business model is going to have to go through business drivers. Any organization is faced with a challenge, an opportunity, some place where it has the ability to make money, to create shareholder value. You may recall the entire purpose of creating a business model. One of the critical components was how do I create value, whether it's uh, through the dent of my internal core competencies or whether it's through by the dent of my processes or my relationships and how do I convert that value into dollars. So this whole journey has taken us through business drivers onto what kind of IT capability do I need in order to meet and exceed the demands placed on us by those business drivers. So you may recall we talked about IT implications of business needs, business requirements. Now it so happens that we discussed IT capabilities components. So one was IT processes, the second one was organization, the third one was infrastructure, you may recall the fourth one was strategy, and now we're going to see the connection between all of these and enterprise architecture. So what is happening is that enterprise architecture is actually painting a picture of your IT capability. It's showing you what does your capability look like today, what should your capability be in the future, where are the gaps, where are the overlaps, you must work towards eliminating overlaps, you must work towards filling the gaps, and then you have fulfilled the promise that started with a business model. So now you, you know, hopefully you're starting to see the connection between business model that translated into business strategy, business capability, business drivers, that then translated into an IT capability which included strategy, processes, organization, infrastructure, and now the, a picture of that capability over time is what enterprise architecture allows us to do. Before we do, go any deeper into this, uh, Sonika, would you please push the poll results? Sure. Uh, well, we had 81% who voted on the poll, and 30% um, of them believed that enterprise architecture function belongs within IT. 28% believe that it belongs within business. 38% believe that it's an independent function, uh, reporting to the CEO. 2% believe that it's an independent function, reporting to the chief operating officer, and 2% are not sure where it belongs. I missed the part uh, about how many think it should be an independent function. What percentage? There are there's 38 percent who believe that it's an it should be an independent function reporting to the CEO. Okay. However, two percent believe that it should be an independent function reporting to the C chief operating officer. So uh, the, there is a split right there, and two percent are not sure exactly where it belongs. So this is a very, very interesting uh, issue that a lot of discussion is happening around uh, the whole uh, enterprise architecture function and where it belongs. And I'm, I'm actually pretty enthused by the responses because it's roughly half and half uh, with IT versus outside of IT as an independent function reporting into directly some business function. And we will see how there really is no correct answer. Uh, because enterprise architecture by its very nature sits on the boundary and hence it can fall in either one of these places. Thank you, Sonica. I think I'm going to push the slides down, please. Sure. All right, so talking about boundaries, talking about those areas where people can claim 
uh, you know, the enterprise architecture belongs with an IT because you know it's on that border, and people can claim that enterprise architecture can be put as part of the business because you know it's again because of connecting business with IT. So you you're starting with the whole idea of creating shareholder value. You devise a business model that's going to create that shareholder value. You then devise a business capability that says, okay, what should my business strategy be? What should my business processes be? What should my organization look like? What should my infrastructure, which includes IT, look like in order to be to enable that business model? Then you're saying, okay, what are the imperatives? Well, what are the critical success factors? What are the business drivers? They're all basically, you know, with semantic differences the same things that there are saying what must I do in order to create a capability that enables that business model and then come the implications for all aspects of the organization including IT and then you create an IT capability which is conceptually the same as a business capability so you have all the four components that we discussed now, as I mentioned before, that this journey that has gone on from the need to create shareholder value to creating IT capability has gone on smoothly because there is an underlying connection between IT capability and shareholder value. That underlying connection is depicted by enterprise architecture. So you see that there is a conceptual design of the organization, then there is a logical design and then there is a physical design. And then there are three different layers, and there, there are people who have used five-layer models. I'm just trying to illustrate that there are different layers within all three of these different conceptual, logical, and physical designs of an organization. And I'm just using a three-layer model to say technology, data, and application. So now enterprise architecture has actually painted a picture of these three using these three layers. But the tricky part, as we go from the journey from dollars to dollars and cents to bits and bytes, you remember how we started the journey to say, okay, how do I connect my IT decisions with what is going to create business value? This whole business IT alignment realm now begins to take shape because now you're going to connect your IT capability from the conceptual to the logical to the physical. Our journey from conceptual to logical and to implementation because this is where we do our work as IT people. What we're doing is we're implementing systems, we're putting an infrastructure in place, we're doing things with, with actual physical objects that now need to make sense in, in the overall business con context and that is why we need to now start to map these things and enterprise architecture helps us map those things. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you the IT capability component. Remember, strategy, process, organization, and technology. So technology, now we are referring to, is actually infrastructure. You see on the right-hand side is what I'm labeling as a key objective. Why is it that we need this particular component? So remember, we were talked about establishing the need and identifying a high-level solution. So when you have a conceptual design, what it's doing for you is saying, okay, what exactly do I need? And what is the best solution? So you, you would devise strategic solution alternatives, and then you're going to devise a way to pick one of those solutions based upon a business case and say, this is the solution I want to implement. And introducing this mix from conceptual to implementation, right? You see how we went from business to technology, dollars and cents to bits and bytes you now have enterprise architecture. And enterprise architecture, I'm dividing up into three different parts. You have your overall enterprises architecture. Within that, you have specific systems architecture. And you also have a network architecture or topology to represent the three different layers. One of the things that I should have mentioned here is the application architecture, but, but you get the picture that you have an overall enterprise architecture and then for each one of the layers. Now, if you want to add a process layer, you'll have a process architecture. And if you want to add an organizational layer, you have an organizational architecture. What exactly is the need for architecture? 
Well, in my opinion, the need is to validate whatever you've been doing conceptually. What that means is that now you, have, you, you taught some good thoughts. Now you're saying, do those thoughts make sense in the real world as I start to look at them from an implementation perspective? Any great idea starts to fizzle if it does not connect with the real world constructs. And now you are starting that journey to say, does it really make sense? You're now saying, okay, it makes sense. How do I design it so that it makes even more sense and I can do it better, faster, quicker, cheaper? You then also start to say, okay, if it's making sense, I can devise and design the solution. Now, what are the specific parts? What are their characteristics? And what is the relationship between these parts? Because remember, we want to eliminate overlaps and we want to fill gaps. And this is the point at which you start to realize what's what, why is it needed, does it connect with overall with my overall objective to create business value? And now you're also starting to see the relationship between all of these different moving parts. So people who, including me, who have compared enterprise architecture to the architecture of a building will start to understand, and I'm really not going to go into the controversy of why in certain instances that analogy doesn't fit, because I'll just, you know, you can do that uh, some other time. We, there's a limited amount of time here that I want to cover a lot of things. So working with this analogy, you start to see that a, a building needs certain rooms. What are the types of rooms? How are they connected? With Whether there's a flow, if, if it's a certain type of a building, if there's a different design architecture, if it's another type of building or a house versus a, an office complex, you'll start to see that a room is a room is a room, except they start to make sense and meaning as we start the journey to say, what purpose does this building serve? And then you say what this room is doing, and then you start to lay the pipes and fixtures after you, you have that discussion, and which is a third stage, which is implementation. Now, this is the point at which the key component of our capability, systems implementation and infrastructure, procurement, everything else that is connected to actually implementing the solution starts to come in. And now your, your focus is, I've understood it's valuable. I've understood it's going to make money. I've understood the, what are the parts and pieces. I've understood how they connect to each other. Now I'm going to say to myself, how do I do this so that A, I actually complete it, right? Because they're a project that never reached completion. And B, how do I do it quicker, faster, cheaper, so that all of those benefits that I identified in my, in my conceptual stage are actually coming to pass and I can see them. Now, I hope it's this journey and the role enterprise architecture plays in this journey is, is evident. It's, it's emerging. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there, there are pieces of this picture that I'm missing that I'm going to be filling up soon. But I hope you understand the journey from shareholder value. The entire reason an organization exists is to create shareholder value. It doesn't matter whether it's a public or a private organization. Value does not have to mean dollars and cents. Value can be many, many different other, other measures. For example, in not-for-profits, it is how many people did you save, how many people did you serve in government. So the concept of value can have different measures, but the, but the concept is the same. You must create shareholder value if you want to be in business. So Monica, would you please push the second poll? Absolutely. If you could all please take a second to uh, answer the poll questions.
All right, the poll is closed now. Sarah. Thank you so much, Sonika. Um, folks, I hope you're participating. Uh, it's, it's going to be really helpful for us to see uh, what you are thinking as we go along and whether we have shifted some thinking or we've learned from uh, your thinking. It will be really, really valuable if you're participating. But in any event, uh, let's talk about, so we've, we've seen the journey, the high-level journey so far, and now let's talk about a particular component because I'm going to dive into enterprise architecture planning in a little bit uh, more depth and detail uh, when we talk about the object-oriented framework, but a key component of the, the, this whole journey is systems strategy. What I mean by that is a particular large, high-value, high-cost, high, value, high, cost, high uh, you know, basically you're, you're investing a lot of resources into a system and in order for that, that to real, realize value for you, you have to understand and create a strategy around that particular system. Here are the key decisions that you're making about that particular investment and this nice chart tries to depict the three layers of that decision making. The first one is setting the context. You know, do I have a business case to build this component? Now remember, all of this is being done in the context, in the overall context of your shareholder value and the entire journey that we've been talking about. But you must create a business case for this particular investment like you created for other investments and solutions that, you, that we talked about. This may be a subset of the overall business case that you created before. You also must, must understand what are the key parts and pieces of this particular system slash solution that you're about to implement. That is, that is another, because the whole activity is scoping. You bite off, and, and this is, uh, and I think I've posted this online as well on CIO Index. If you bite off more than you can chew, create these projects that are $40 million projects, then your chances of failure are much, much greater than if you were to eat an elephant one bite at a time. And that is a key learning for anybody who has implemented a project and anybody who's actually implemented and failed at a project understands how important scoping is. So it's not just a, an activity where you pick certain parts. Which parts you pick up is as important as anything else that you're going to be doing in a systems implementation. You're going to design what needs to connect with what. Another key thing that I've seen missing from many, many business strategies, system strategy, IT strategy, is collateral. You may buy a nail and you buy a hammer and you want to put up a painting, phenomenal. There are things that you may do when you strike the nail with a hammer, you break the drywall, you do things that break. If you do not understand what the impact and implication is going to be of that particular system, you are going to end up in a place where you say, how did I reach here? You reached there because you weren't thinking about what could happen around you. Compliance is another one of those things. Building versus buying, that's another key decision that you make at a, at a system strategy level. And then, of course, the good old implementation plan, the overall implementation strategy, or you, know, you decide, decide whether it's going to be a big bang, it's going to be phases, what phases, what steps and schedules, what deliverables, what roles and responsibilities. You decide the whole idea and issues related to the team, the structure, and all of those wonderful things. Now, you may recall and you may make the connection that this in and of itself is connected and common to everything else that you've done developing any capability to this point. The second thing which is important is systems implementation. This neat chart depicts an iterative approach to system implementation. You are, first of all, you have these phases, design, construct, test, and deliver. And in each one of those phases, you have activities that you perform. And if you're doing this, you know, trying to be successful, then you would do it in a multiple, you know, phase, prototype, iterative fashion where you create something, the core, and then you go about developing things around it till you reach the final product. So again, iteration is an absolutely critical component of any successful systems implementation design. So I think would you please push the results of the second poll? 
Sure. Uh, we had better participation on this uh, poll. About 86% of the attendees um, participated in the poll. 68% of those believed that enterprise architecture exists to reduce costs. 60% believed that it exists to increase revenues. 73% believed that it exists to reduce risk. And 86%, almost all believe that it, 86% um, uh, of those voted believe that it helps, uh, it exists to help communications within IT and with the business. Of course, 1% do believe that enterprise architecture is, is overhyped. <laughs> it's, it's always interesting to see that 1%. Uh, I, think, I think you may be onto something. I think uh, enterprise architecture, the way it's being implemented, and again, I, I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but the way I've seen this implemented where rooms, uh, you know, conference rooms are full of charts, wall-to-wall -wall charting with diagrams uh, really scares me because now you've got a zealot who believes in, uh, you know, the value of enterprise architecture, but they have basically lost track of what is important and why it exists. So I, that 1%, I can certainly see uh, what you're thinking. But it's, it's actually heartening to hear the rest of you uh, think in, in terms of um, the value that it delivers. And all of the above is one of the options that I took out at the last minute because, quite frankly, it's all of the above. It, it's supposed to reduce cost because, uh, you know, it's taking away overlaps and it's, it's uh, re reducing redundancy. Um, it's reducing risk because now you have something which is much more solid and concrete. You can see where you're headed. Uh, so I think I think all of these things are very interesting as uh, as we look at enterprise architecture planning. All right, on to another way of looking at enterprise architecture. Thank you, Sonia. Welcome. You may recall that we discussed IT processes. They're a critical component of IT capability. We also discussed, when we, were, when we were looking at IT processes, we discussed how there are three different types of processes, innovation stream processes that take a concept to product. We have delivery stream processes that take the product to the customer. And then we have management control processes that actually make sure that the promise is delivered on. When we look at these three, there are three different drivers. You know, there are three different things that make us do these three different types of processes or, or three reasons for doing these processes. Revenue drives innovation stream processes. That's the focal point. That's focus of all what we do. Delivery stream processes are driven by cost and management and control processes are driven by risk. The reason I wanted to make this make this uh, you know IT process discussion a part of this, this mix is because if you look at IT processes then you will notice that enterprise architecture planning is actually part of innovation stream processes where you're taking a concept to product. Just like IT strategy, strategy and IT prioritization, enterprise architecture planning is helping us innovate. Hence the whole discussion of where does enterprise architecture planning, just like IT strategy, it can, it can fall under IT or it can fall under quote unquote business. Application development, maintenance, and infrastructure are obviously delivery stream processes because they are, they are giving us an actual product delivered to the customer. And then IT governance includes program management, risk management, and budgeting and such. So I wanted to give you a flavor for our discussion of IT processes and how it relates to enterprise architecture planning. You'll also, also notice that we talked about efficiency and effectiveness. You know, everything that we do, two buzzwords, efficiency, effectiveness. Well, this diagram connects those two with your revenue, risk, and cost, and then your key activity stash processes, because remember, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, enterprise architecture planning system, system strategy are actually very high on effectiveness they may not be as high on efficiency because they are still at a conceptual level. They are still 
paperware, they're still vaporware. The efficiency dimension is actually helped by implementation operations and support. You'll notice that IT alignment and portions of the architecture, which are, which are the conceptual design, are part of very high efficiency and effectiveness. And of course, efficiency and effectiveness are both helped by program management, risk management, IT budget, which is the whole realm of IT governance. Again, I wanted to connect all of these different concepts, all of the different buzzwords that we've been discussing. I wanted to connect them into a continuous stream where we could see one concept and be able to connect it to another concept. Well, I've already started by saying that enterprise architecture for an organization is like an architecture for a building. Now, here's the reason why I'm just trying to elaborate a little bit on why is it that I feel that way. And I know there are, there are people who say that this analogy fails in certain places, and I agree with some of that thinking, but I'm not going to go over it in this webinar. Enterprise architecture is multi-layered, and it represents, it shows you, it paints a picture of the enterprise. What are the parts and pieces of the enterprise? What are the building blocks? How do they relate to each other? So we can identify gaps, we can identify overlaps. Enterprise architecture is also a construct that goes over time. It's not a point in time representation. It is a point in time representation for multiple slices that you take over a period of time. So what, when, and where of how things are done in the organization is represented there, and how many resources are being utilized for a particular activity must be represented in. And I'm going to show you how we do this in an object oriented way. The whole concept, the whole idea of enterprise architecture planning is because you want to become more effective, you want to become more efficient, you want to make money, you want to do this faster, quicker, cheaper, and hence you're painting this picture of the enterprise over a period of time. You want to identify gaps, eliminate them, I mean, I'm sorry, fill them. You want to identify overlaps, you want to eliminate them, and then you want to be able to communicate all of these gaps, overlaps to both internally people who are building, stuff need to see what stuff they're building, why they're building it, how it connects to each other, and that there is a purpose and meaning to their entire existence. And almost as importantly, it's absolutely critical that you are able to communicate all of these things with your partners whom we call quote-unquote business, but whom I just call your partners because quite frankly, this thinking of IT not being business is hurting us and the sooner we start using IT as a business and stop using terms like business to describe marketing and uh, you know our, our finance and the HR organizations, the better off we're all going to be. One dimension that I missed in this slide, we, we, we've discussed in the question that we took, it all reduces our overall risk. Sonika, would you please push the third poll? And again, I'd really appreciate all of you participating because that also gives us a Okay, here it is. Yeah, I guess uh, that's plenty of time. Okay, so the poll is closed, and we are off to 
diving a little deeper into enterprise architecture layers. So we spoke about the three layers, the conceptual, logical, and physical. We also spoke about the three different layers, the, the application, information, and, and technology layers, which are running parallel. And what I wanted to show in this diagram is the connection between trying to get from business to technology, the connection from trying to get from conceptual to actually specific bits and bytes happens with these objective, uh, I'm sorry, with these different layers. The conceptual is trying to lay out the objectives, the business processes and scope, whether it's an application, information or technology. With applications, your logical design is going to give you the functional design, the information flows. So I'm not going to read all of these things. I just wanted to highlight the fact that there are different things that happen at each one of these different layers. And if you connect this diagram to the one that we saw before, where we made the connection between why we do a particular activity at these different layers and levels. So now you're getting a flavor for enterprise architecture planning from a strategic, from a business perspective, and not necessarily from a bits and bytes perspective. I'm trying to make the connection, not dive deep into the specifics of how you actually do enterprise architecture planning. Enterprise architecture planning is doing two things for us. It's actually doing four. I'm just mentioning these two because a lot of times people want to make the connection uh, you know, to sell enterprise architecture. So I'm just going to focus on these two. You're saving money by eliminating duplication. So any place where there is overlap, you want to eliminate it. You are making things more efficient by creating standards and policies and procedures because you, know, you don't want to have 55 different types of database systems in the organization. You don't want to have you know, APIs and services that have, that have already been created. You don't want to create them again. You also want to create an optimized view of IT demand. And, and going back to the whole supply and demand discussion of IT, that view. You want to create an optimized IT demand for software, hardware, and services. As those of you recall, IT procurement depends on creating this optimized view. Otherwise, each group is ordering their servers, each group is ordering their applications and testing tools, it's not going to be a pretty picture. Enterprise architecture is making you money by identifying key capability gaps that if you were to plug by definition, if our journey from shareholder value and business capability and business model is true and it's, it's done correctly, then those gaps must be filled if we are going to be effective in creating business value. We're also creating money by optimizing processes. By, by optimizing processes, we are reducing time to market. And for those of you who are in business inclined, marketing inclined, understand how important it is to create a very, very short time to market because product cycles, sometimes market entry, sometimes first mover advantage are all contingent upon your ability to create uh, I missed I'm sorry uh, optimizing processes to reduce time to market is absolutely critical when you want to create shareholder value uh, now we are going to uh, talk about enterprise architecture planning from an object oriented perspective but I wanted to push the poll results for the third poll Sonica would you please do that We had 84% of the participants who, uh, who uh, shared their opinions on this poll. 20% believe that the 20% believe that their enterprise architecture is documented. 13% uh, say that enterprise architecture is available to all IT employees. 26% believe that their enterprise architecture is used to make decisions and 41% are not sure if they have an enterprise architecture in their organization. As you can see, we've got a, got a huge problem and thank you everybody who participated. I mean, this is, this is what depicts to all of us the, the real problem that, you know, the creation of enterprise architecture is sketchy. The communication 
because you know what's the point of creating all these neat charts and diagrams if nobody's watching them, uh, looking at them, knows they exist, know what they can do for you, and then what's the point of having that communication if you're not using it? So I mean, I I I hope that we've highlighted something that you can use moving forward. But understand that this is where the problem with getting funding for enterprises architecture comes in because we're always struggling with uh, you know some aspect of it. But I'm gonna I'm gonna run through because we have you're you're running over. So in any event, when you when you look at a typical enterprise architecture planning activity, you're looking at the layers that I described: technology, data, and application. The business object's view to enterprise architecture planning simplifies all of these by saying that if you look at real life, if you look at how na in nature things exist, they exist as objects. You have an invoice. You don't have data for the invoice, applications for the invoice, technology for the invoice. You have as something called an invoice. You have a customer. You have an order. So why not have enterprise architecture reflect those objects? versus trying to create these artificial constructs that now continuously and constantly you have to connect in your mind and try to connect to them then to um, the other concept constructs that exist in your technology domain so you're you're unmuted you're mute, unmuted at this point I'm sorry can you hear me yes okay please mute it I wanted to show you a, a depiction of enterprise architecture planning when we do this in this manner to illustrate the point. Obviously, we don't have enough time to go through every single thing and say, okay, um, you know, how does this work and how do you do it? But it's a really, really simple way of saying, okay, if you are able to understand the objects in your environment, then you ought to be able to take a particular domain and in that domain, identify the objects and identify the specific applications that relate I'm just showing you an application layer at this point because uh, you know we have, we have to run through a few slides so this representation is showing you a particular domain and how the different objects relate to each other and how you can actually map the applications to and this is this is an actual thing that was done how this all relates in a very simple, easy to understand manner because you're starting with objects that exist in your environment. These are natural constructs, not artificial constructs that you've created for the purpose of diagramming. You can now try and see the associations between these objects, between the specific functions slash processes within these objects and now start to see the connection that each one of these has. You, you can see the gaps and you can see the overlaps. You can map your applications to the specific objects. So you'll see we have a customer. The customer is served by these specific applications and you can see that we have started the journey from current, tactical to strategic, the whole time dimension to enterprise architecture planning. And this will help us draw some really, really neat way. One page, that's the enterprise architecture of a 12 to $14 billion organization, is this one page that shows you, and I, I don't know, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm going to go forward and see, but we are basically representing this entire organization's enterprise architecture and applications using business objects to show you the current state of this organization the tactical state of this organization. I mean, for those of you who you can see certain shades going away, certain areas being shaded, certain areas being unshaded, to show what exists, what will exist in the future, what's being eliminated. And then the strategic view to show in three pages how your organization is going to go from where it is to where it needs to go. For those of you who've done road mapping or, or like the concept of road mapping, this is, in my experience, the best road mapping technique that I've seen. We haven't put other dimensions to it. We can put a cost dimension to it. 
we can put a, a data layer, a technology layer, but the whole idea is to combine all of these into an object layer to show you what objects exist in your environment and how they relate to your physical, touchable con constructs in your IT capability domain. Now this is showing you one area of migration as to where you are, what you're going to do next, and how you're going to get from that step onto your strategic dimension, which is where you want to be. And then, of course, you have recommendations going with it. Just say what you need to do as you move from your current, your tactical, to your strategic. Now, I, the reason for using an enterprise architecture technique which is object oriented is a very simple reason. One, you're mapping, you're designing and architecture a representation of your organization the way it actually exists in real life. You're creating a representation that business people can understand because they understand invoices more than they understand data and technology layers. Within that object, now you are showing those business people how IT constructs are related to those constructs that they understand, so the communication with the business is improved because it understands now how applications relate to things that they are trying to do. And then you can translate it for programmers and architects, you know, systems architects, to say this is how I'm actually taking a business construct and this is how I'm going to be constructing something useful for the business. So, at, and I don't want to call it a bottom layer, but, but the, the, the other side, the technology side, can now see what's happening and why is it relevant. And you can create a diagram that people understand. You can create a vehicle for communications which doesn't exist in the, the, the other frameworks uh, such as Zachman and, and such where you know you have reams and reams of paper that are being used to represent something and then the business really does not understand what's going on until they see the whole thing. But this representation, and I've done it both ways, and this representation has been much, much more meaningful when it comes to interaction and building something which is of value to the business. So I, you know, unfortunately I can only go show you these three things because you know, the, the limited amount of time, maybe at a later date we're going to go, go through a step-by-step -step as to how to create this, but I just wanted you to get a flavor for there's a better way and this is something that has existed for decades now but uh, not being used that much. The last thing I wanted to cover and we've already run over time so I'm going to go over it very, very briefly. Most people who are in enterprise architecture, CIOs, who are trying to get funding or fund these projects want to, want to say, how do I sell enterprise architecture plan? Well, you can understand that most people don't want to fund an activity that where they don't see the returns. And infrastructure is one of those areas where you say, I want to construct a road from, from you know, point A to point B, and traffic is going to flow and good things are going to come off it. It's a very nice thing in concept, but would you as an investor try, want to invest in that road unless you're collecting tolls? So you have to understand that enterprise architecture selling can be simplified by doing the following. A, you have to package it with something else where you, with the revenue side of the equation. So whether it's an IT strategy project which is creating a business case, you club one of the solutions and do a piece of the enterprise architecture or you club it and put it as part of the implementation project, but you're going to have to find a source of revenues in that business case if you want to get funded. You have to use this cost-benefit analysis, business case approach, and clubbing it with other activity in order to sell enterprise architecture planning. Well, I'm going to stop here because I've already run over time and I haven't left much time for question and answer. Uh, so, Sonika, it's yours. I thank all of you for being patient with me and participating. Sonika, if you don't mind, please take over and uh, if there are any questions, let's uh, respond to them now. Uh, thank you, Saurabh. Uh, we do have a few questions that came up. Um, there was one uh, participant who uh, was not sure as to which methodology you were referring to or if there was any specific one that you were referring to, to during your presentation. 
You know, this methodology originally where I read about this was in a book by Jackson. And I don't remember the name, but I'm going to, for those of you who are interested, uh, I can send you the name and the reference to that book. We use that to create uh, the framework and implement this. Uh, so that's the closest I can get to, uh, you know, naming the methodology. But to my knowledge, there is no branded methodology that exists uh, that does this enterprise architecture planning in an object-oriented way. Um, thank you, Saurabh. Um, now, another question is from a participant who wanted to know, uh, you know, why uh, do organizations face uh, problems getting funding for enterprise architecture pro uh, projects? The benefits they believe are clear, then why is there this resistance? You know, uh, what, what has happened is that a lot of us who have grown, uh, you know, within IT and, and seen IT perform, enterprise architecture has started to represent to us endless diagramming. You know, well-meaning people who start and finish their day creating diagrams without actually telling us how they're going to use them, how is it that it's going to create value. And for somebody who's been in a position to fund activities like this and been on the business side, you know, hearing from the CIO saying, can we fund this activity, I can assure you when I, and I am an IT guy, I grew up in IT, quite frankly, I didn't see it. I didn't see the connection being made between strategy, between business models and business value and enterprise architecture. So the place where I started to see value being created and enterprise architecture really, really being so critical to, to the success of an organization, being recognized as such but now being funded as such was where I started to see it being clubbed with other things, other activities such as you know creating a business case for uh, you know some solution that's going to help you implement a strategy some implementation and taking it bits and pieces at a time not trying to map the entire organization but taking a particular domain taking a particular division taking something which is a smaller piece a smaller budget and plumbing that budget with something else was the place where you know i believe the funding solutions started to emerge Thank you for that, Saurabh. Um, another question that I have for you uh, presented here is how can one improve enterprise architecture to make it more effective? And uh, would you be able to give us uh, some examples of what other organizations are doing? Yeah, I would, I would say that breaking enterprise architecture down into pieces, doing this as a process, iterative process over a period of time, at each step demonstrating the value of what you've developed by A, creating something that people want to see, B, developing it in collaboration with people who are going to use it both on the business side and on the IT side, C, now making sure that you have linked it to something such as a building permit process, which is, in my opinion, the most important process in any IT organization which is, in my opinion, the least utilized and the most abused process is a building permit process. If you combine all of these various things, then you start to see the value of our enterprise architecture being communicated, being used, being realized, and people supportive, uh, being supportive of enterprise architecture. So I would recommend a very solid, robust, meaningful building permit process because a lot of building permit processes are just meetings where people are, you know, just getting together in a room and nothing really of value comes out of it um, because you're, 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 you don't have the requisite authority to stop things that you, you believe should be stopped. I think all of those things can lead to, uh, you know, better utilization of this absolutely critical skill, which is enterprise architecture planning. Great, sir. I think we have time for just one more question. And... Um... Uh, it's probably a question that you already did answer or, or address during one of our um, polls. Uh, that is, where does our enterprise architecture function belong? Uh, what does it belong within IT or within business? Uh, so if you could just elaborate a little bit on that, because we had a few of people ask that after the poll. You know, um, I, it, it's, it can belong in either one of these organizations. For now, I think because of connectivity and because of the building permit process, 
Uh, my recommendation is to keep it within IT. Uh, I think also because enterprise architects are typically, uh, you know, this is not a capability that is developed through a degree program or this is not something which is coming, uh, you know, well cooked and baked. I know there are certain programs we created around enterprise architecture. So for now, uh, enterprise architectures are coming from within the IT organization. They're growing up within the IT organization so this function can actually uh, mature within the organization and then at a, at a particular time when we have enterprise architectures who are, uh, architects who are much more uh, the business types for the lack of a better, better word, I think it can actually go to the business world. But for now, for all those reasons, I, my recommendation is to keep it within IT. Uh, could we just fit in one more question, Saurabh? Um, uh, how does service orientation as an architectural pattern fit in? You know, service orientation um, is a natural construct that comes out of this whole object-oriented way of looking at things. And to me, if you are into service or service orientation, then I would, uh, uh, you know, highly recommend that you look at the object-oriented way of using enterprise architecture planning because the transition from there to, uh, you know, the, the various objects that uh, implement those services would be much smoother and much faster and much more natural than taking, let's just say, something done in a Zachman and trying to convert it into, uh, you know, service oriented concepts. Uh, thank you, Saurabh. I think that is all uh, the time that we have. And uh, I would like to thank um, everyone today for joining us. Um, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed the webinar. Your feedback is really appreciated as we continually strive to improve upon what we deliver to our members. You may send us your feedback to us at webmaster1 at ciindex.com. Uh, we apologize if we didn't get to the questions that you asked. You may email your questions to us at the same email and uh, we will uh, try and answer those questions for you. Our next webinar in the series, IT Portfolio Rationalization, is scheduled for May 1st. You may register for it at ciindex.com. You will also find a list of our other upcoming webinars there. It's not a comprehensive list yet. We are still updating it. Thank you once again for joining us today. You may exit the webinar by simply clicking the X on your control panel or choosing File, then Exit. Thank you and have a great day.